So thanks to my experience in big uh, uh, in distributed systems and in the IoT market, I can share with you some of the use cases so how you can apply uh, distributed frameworks such as Spark, Flink, and Ignite to solve uh, uh, the cases for IoT applications and services. How you can build an infrastructure that will be able to process all the workloads coming from your smart meters, from your smart sensors, from your edge devices deployed in factories or in plants. And the agenda for today is pretty simple. So first, before we start diving into the uh, into the kind of into the way how a problem can be solved, let's take a look what are the demands uh, that are coming from IoT empowered applications and services. After that, uh, when we know these demands, I would introduce a high-level software stack that you, as an architect, should keep in mind. It's not the detailed one; it's not will be a breakdown, but it's something that some of the main building blocks you will have in your uh, IoT solution or project. Uh, and after that, we are going to drill down on every module of this stack. We are going to look into a device operating system or real-time operating system that, uh, that is running on your uh, edge devices. And to make things clear, uh, well, the, an edge device is any device such as smart meter, sensor, smart watches, uh, everything else uh, that is uh, running on a constrained device and gathers uh, measurements, information around your environment or around the field of uh, the device applicability. Also, uh, as you will see, there are different uh, additional layers that are used in this architecture, such as data collection and enrichment layer. Uh, and for sure, we are going to use uh, some data storage, some distributed storage, which I call hybrid transactional and analytical platform. And finally, uh, when we come up with our HTAP platform, we want to be sure that that platform uh, gives us enough APIs needed to build powerful applications on top of it. And usually, uh, I end up every my conversation, every my presentation with a demo, and that meeting is not an exception for us. So at the end of the of this talk, I will show you how you can quickly create a simple application using Apache Ignite, Apache Spark, and process, transmit some data, stream some data into the cluster, and process it in real time. Well, uh, as for the demands, the first demand uh, that is uh, pretty crucial for the IoT space is real time processing. Oh, okay. Well, Yes, the first one is real-time processing. And here is we mean that uh, for some of the applications uh, in the Tau ET realm, it's absolutely critical to be sure that all the data, all the measurements that are delivered to your software stack can be processed and received in real time. Just imagine that uh, your software is uh, uh, running on some uh, autom uh, automatic driving car. And that car is all uh, usually equipped by a variety of different sensors. And it's uh, totally, it's, uh, it's a critical requirement to be sure that every measurement, every information that is coming, delivered by your sensors is processed in real time. If you cannot f f meet uh, this requirement, you can get into a car accident. And for sure, we want to avoid this. The next requirement is, uh, uh, is how your platform is broad in terms of APIs. Uh, IoT developers, if we, talk, if we are talking about the back-end developers or high-end developers, the guys who are writing uh, back-end software for your IoT solution, they also want to use uh, common APIs like uh, SQL, uh, like key value operations. And what's else specific for IoT is uh, if, you're, if, you, if you invented some project that uh, transmits uh, your location, your proximity, and also you want to store the data in so-called geospatial format, and it will be not even, it will be beneficial if your platform supports geospatial data and APIs out of the box. Uh, the next thing is uh, analytics. So for some of the products, 
it's, it might not be requirement, but for the rest, when you want to understand what's happening to your system or what, what's happened to your uh, smart meters deployed in some factory a day ago or a week ago, you want to execute some analytical workloads. And most likely, you will be executing nowadays, you will be executing them in parallel to the operational workloads, in parallel to the new information that is arriving to your uh, software stack. And considering this, uh, nowadays uh, high availability becomes, uh, became not just a nice feature to have, but a sort of a requirement. Uh, a lot of their projects, they want to be sure that whatever happens to my system, whatever happens to my architecture, I want to be up and running. Uh, unless, you know, the whole data center goes down. But even if the whole data center goes down, there is a solution, right? You can have several data centers that work in parallel. And that's all about high availability. And finally, high availability, close to the high availability requirement, we have simple scalability uh, uh, requirement. That implies uh, that first, we want to invest in such a solution uh, that allows us to scale out gradually. So probably at some point in time, we are going to start with uh, hundreds of meters, smart meters deployed somewhere. But all the time, we want to scale out. We want to deploy uh, thousands and dozens of thousand meters. And our software architecture has to react accordingly. It, it should be simple. It has to be simple to uh, scale out your existing software. And based on these demands, actually, we can uh, take a look at this from this IoT software stack perspective. Uh, starting from the bottom, first, uh, if you're going to create your new IoT solution, like first you need to deploy some edge devices, like smart meters somewhere. And those smart meters, they also uh, have to be programmed. They ha you have to develop applications from them, software. And usually, there are spe special type of operating systems and APIs that are developed for this sort of uh, uh, devices. Uh, if your device is powerful enough uh, and you can run a Linux operating system, embedded Linux on it, then you are good to go. You can install Linux and you can use POS6 APIs provided by that operating system. But usually, uh, all these edge devices, uh, they are running on constrained hardware. And under the constrained hardware, I mean uh, uh, the uh, chipsets that have around, let's say, that have a uh, dozen kilobytes of RAM and a couple of megabytes of flash. This is all they have. But that space, uh, that amount of memory is, is enough, you know, to install in a, a real-time operating system on it and to develop applications that will uh, gather different metrics surrounding uh, uh, the smart meters and transmit all this information back to your uh, distributed storage and back to your software stack. On top of this, uh, the next layer, which is called data collection and enrichment, usually this layer interacts with your smart devices. Uh, in this layer, you're going to uh, connect to your smart devices, pull information from there, or the smart devices will push the information to this layer you can enrich this data, meaning that you can take the raw data and transform it, adding something useful, adding some payload that is needed for your uh, application. And right after that, right after you update it, right after you receive the data, you want to store it somewhere. And for big deployments or for the deployments uh, that are supposed to scale out over the time, we want to store this data in a distributed uh, platform, in a distributed database. And we, want, we don't want uh, in this distributed storage or database to be only you know, SQL based. I want to interact with this storage using another APIs that are needed for my application. And this is why we are looking here into the so-called HTAP platforms or new SQL solutions. And that platform will be capable of storing the data in a distributed fashion and will provide you a variety of APIs. Uh, that, your, uh, that your application can benefit from. And today I'm representing uh, Apache Ignite Software Foundation and we are going to discuss uh, the uh, software 
uh, that perfectly well fits to every layer depicted on this diagram, and all this software belongs to Apache. Uh, the bottommost layer here is we will be, I will briefly introduce you to Apache Minute. It's a real-time operating system uh, that is, this is actually the first and the only one at the moment, real-time operating system that is available under Apache 2.0 license. As for the next layer, data collection and enrichment, here is we have uh, much more options. Uh, for the data, you know, for the initial data processing and receiving and uh, transformation, we can use Spark, we can use Kafka, we can use Flink. And today we are going to uh, briefly look at Kafka, we are going to, sorry, to look at Spark and Flink. And I will show you during the demo how you can uh, wire up together Ignite and Spark. And Ignite is uh, going to be used as our distributed uh, computational uh, platform and now distributed storage. On top of, once you use Ignite uh, for this purpose, uh, your application will be empowered by a variety of different APIs. And today I'm going to show you some of the APIs that are useful for the IoT use case. We're not going to explore the whole platform because it would take a lot of time. I just want you to learn something that is specific for the IoT applications. Okay, now let's take a look at every building block from here in more details. So first, Apache Minute, what's so special about this operating system? First, this is open source, real-time operating system uh, that really can run on a constrained devices, on the devices or microcontrollers uh, that are empowered by Cortex-M processors, CPUs for instance. And if you to give some you know, basic understanding on this, a microcontroller usually is small chip uh, that has a CPU, RAM, flash, and sometimes networking components embedded. And you usually take this chip, this small chip, and uh, build your smart watches, your smart meters using that hardware. And once you construct it, once you assembled your hardware, you can flash Apache Manute there and use the rest of the APIs it supports. For instance, you can write standard uh, networking applications. You can communicate to your uh, backend system uh, using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and uh, networking protocol, and utilize TCP IP or UDP. At the same time, uh, uh, when you need uh, to update your software, first you Apache Manute has many other real-time operating systems. They guarantee uh, that the data that is going to be flashed, the software that is going to be flashed on the, into the hardware, that will be secured. So you can define some security policies to double check that nobody else, rather than you, can update the software on your hardware. And speaking about the updates, uh, uh, modern real-time operating systems they do not you know, force you to come to your factory or to the plant where your smart meters are deployed, or Apple doesn't require you, you know, to deliver all its smart watches back to the office if they want to update the hardware, software. All this stuff can be done remotely. And you as an, as an IoT architect or IoT developer, you also, once you install Apache Manute, you can update Apache Manute version and the version of your software remotely from your office. Uh, the next layer, data collection and enrichment layer. Th that's layer, so as I said, it interacts, directly interacts with your uh, edge devices. So usually you can connect to your edge devices using different networking protocols, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, depending on the scenario. And once you connect to your devices, you can utilize uh, Spark streaming functionality or Flink streaming functionality to receive initial data from there. Uh, you can, as you know, you can, ex you can scale out your Spark cluster, for instance, depending on the workload coming from your uh, smart meters. And later on, once you receive this data, you can process this data in, in parallel, uh, enrich this data with additional information. And right after that, when the initial pre-processing pre -processing of the data is done, you can move it on to your final storage, to your distributed system, uh, where the data will be spread out across a cluster of machines 
And on top of that system, you can write additional applications uh, that can do some useful thing with that. OK, and if to talk about that uh, platform, about Ignite as our HTAP platform, as our distributed storage and computational database. So actually, Apache Ignite is a memory computing platform uh, that is durable, always available, uh, and provides powerful SQL, key value, and other processing APIs. So at the core of this system uh, lies so-called memory-centric storage. The memory-centric storage implies that the RAM, main memory, is treated not as a cache layer. It's treated as a one primary storage at the storage where your data as well as indexes will be kept by Ignite. At the same time, the memory centric means that uh, you can still use disk as your uh, secondary memory tier just for the sake of the durability. If you want to be sure that if some bad happens to a cluster, imagine that your whole data center goes down and you just, you for sure don't want to lose the data. But if you enable this persistence, if you enable Ignite native persistence for sure, then you can be sure that after the cluster restart, you will not uh, miss a piece of your data. All the data will be persisted on disk and you can start working with your data right away. So, Ignite native persistence uh, is tightly integrated with the overall memory architecture. And usually it stores the superset of data on disk. And you can have as much data in RAM as you can afford. So, and at the same time, you can perceive the data on third party databases or storages like NoSQL uh, databases like MongoDB, Cassandra, or relational databases. It's up to you. But there are some of the differences between Ignite native persistence and third party persistence. So if you, uh, if you, if you, have, if you are interested in this, then I'll be uh, happy to elaborate more on this at the end of our talk. But OK, and all this storage is distributed, right? So all this memory is available across the cluster of machines you have. And once you have your, all the data and indexes in RAM, you can leverage from the variety of APIs provided by Ignite, like SQL, key value, uh, MapReduce framework, uh, which, is, which we call compute grid machine learning, and other capabilities. If to, uh, if to look into this distributed storage, in reality, this distributed storage is a key value database. So the same hash table, so we all know how to work with hash tables, right? So every hash table consists of several buckets. And here is we are dealing with the same hash table with the only difference that every bucket is, uh, belongs to a specific cluster node, specific cluster machine of Ignite. And we call, uh, in Ignite, we call these buckets as partitions. Some other products call uh, these kind of buckets as shards, when people use sharding technology to uh, spread out the data. Uh, and for sure, uh, once you spread out this data evenly across the cluster of machines, you automatically get, uh, you can automatically load balance the workloads. So every API call that comes to your application, depending on the data locality, uh, that API call can go to one cluster node or to another. And this is how you can scale out your overall uh, data storage, and this is how you can uh, so-called scale out your workloads by just adding new nodes to your cluster whenever it's needed. Uh, the next, so speaking about the APIs, so the, since that's the key value storage, probably the fastest uh, way possible to interact with the key value based storage is to use key value operations. So if you know an ID of your uh, let's say, an ID of your smart meter, and you just want to get information about this smart meter, for instance, where it's deployed, uh, in which geographical location, uh, then you just can take this ID of the smart meter and send a query to your cluster. And then we can take this ID and we can identify precisely where this information is located. Because for every ID we can calculate a primary node that stores the data for this uh, type of record. And if you execute millions or 
uh, hundreds of thousands of such queries in real time, you can see that all these queries will be sent to different nodes. And this is how you can distribute your workloads by using simple key value operations. Uh, the other API that is useful for IoT applications is SQL. It's required when you want to execute some advanced queries, like you want to see what was the highest temperature reported by your smart meters, or uh, uh, where uh, what was uh, how many smart meters failed uh, throughout the previous week. All this information is easy, easy to retrieve using SQL language, right? So, and if you don't want to invent your own language. Uh, Ignite offers you full-fledged SQL APIs on top of it, and even more so, it's quite often Ignite is used as a just full-fledged SQL database, uh, simply because uh, you can execute not only standard select queries, but you also can update data using uh, operations like inserts, update, deletes. If you want to configure uh, your uh, cluster data sets, you can use create table commands, you can define indexes and redefine indexes re in real time. And all these operations can be done not only from Java.net or C++ libraries that are provided by Ignite out of the box, but you connect to your cluster from your favorite tool or from your favorite language using ODBC or GDBC drivers. This is what we uh, provide here. The next uh, interesting thing is uh, Compute Grid. So actually, Compute Grid is Ignite's map-reduced framework. So the same framework you're accustomed to use in Spark or in Hadoop. So the, the idea is the same. You write your computational logic, and you, issue, you send this computational logic to your cluster. And, uh, this, and depending on the type of this computational logic, it can be just uh, uh, randomly distributed across a cluster of machines, as we see here. Uh, and if you apply different load balancing techniques for this logic, for different calculations, then Ignite can, you know, prefer underloaded cluster nodes for new jobs calculations rather than overloaded nodes in your cluster. Uh, speaking about Spark, so Spark if you use Ignite and Spark together for your IoT solutions, uh, Spark usage uh, is not limited to the streaming uh, part. It's not limited only to the data processing and enrichment step. Uh, if you like, if you're kind of advanced Spark user and you prefer to keep working with Spark APIs, Ignite is integrated with Spark. So you, actually what you can do, you can connect from your Spark applications to your underlying Ignite cluster and work, uh, work with the data stored in Ignite using Spark RDD APIs, for instance. So I will show you today how we can connect to the uh, to Ignite cluster from Spark, uh, get access to our uh, data sets stored in Ignite cluster from Spark shared RDDs, and how we can you know, work with this data using that already known Spark API. Yeah? Is Ignite a database? Say? Is Ignite a database? What is the Ignite database? Is Ignite on Amazon Web Services? Ignite, uh, uh, so Ignite can be deployed on premise or in any cloud environment. It doesn't matter. So you can go, you can go and deploy Ignite on AWS, Microsoft Azure, or Google Compute Engine. Or you can, or as I show you today, you can deploy your Ignite cluster on your local laptop. It's up to you. No, you just, uh, there are two things. Uh, first, uh, there are, Ignite is available on uh, Amazon Marketplace, so you can install it from there. Or you can just go ahead and download Ignite from uh, Ignite site and upload it to your uh, Amazon Cloud and set it up there. Uh, there is no, so the question is, uh, does Ignite support S3 storage? So there is no any uh, s support out of the box, but if you want to use S3 as your persistence layer, there is a straightforward, you know, like five methods API that you need to implement. That's it, if you want to use S3 as your storage. But most likely you don't need to use S3. You can use 
for instance, if you use Apache Ignite persistence and you need to do some backups, backups copy of your data, then S3 is a good, like, is a good place to store your backups, something like that. But there are a lot of options, options how you can use Ignite and deploy it on AWS. Uh, good, it disappeared. Yeah, I just and finally, for these scenarios, when your IoT solution, when your IoT applications need to do some more than just advanced uh, lookups using SQL, or it's even not enough for you to uh, utilize our MapReduce framework, uh, then you can uh, uh, take a look at the machine learning grid. So it's a set of machine learning APIs that are being developed on top of Ignite. And actually, there is a reason why we decided to initiate this development. Uh, because we talked a lot to our customers and users, and they shared the idea, you know, guys, we already use your compute grid, your MapReduce framework, and we use your uh, uh, distributed storage capabilities and build, build our own machine learning applications on top of it. Why don't you go ahead and, you know, implement your own? Why don't you simplify? Why, why don't you facilitate uh, this part? from your side and develop these APIs uh, on Apache Ignite side. And now we've, we have some uh, machine learning enthusiasts in our Apache Ignite community uh, that already developed a distributed core algebra uh, framework on top of uh, Apache Ignite distributed storage. And they are working on a variety of different uh, essential uh, machine learning algorithms such as k-means clustering, linear and logistic regressions, uh, decision trees, and so on and so forth. So this is something that is new. That component is available in beta. And here is, I'm just mentioning it because if there is someone of you, because machine learning is still required and used in IoT, and if there is someone of you who is uh, passionate about machine learning, if someone of you wants to implement some distributed version of a well-known algorithm, just Stop by Apache Ignite community. We will welcome you, uh, and we will help you to make you successful, and you will be able to contribute to this library, making something new, useful, and building your skills in this direction. Well, that was, I think that that is enough about APIs, about capabilities. So all these capabilities, I just picked only those capabilities that are related to IoT, uh, for IoT scenarios. And speaking about, and, and if we, it's obvious why we should use Spark of Link, right, for these sort of scenarios. But why should we rely on Apache Ignite? So speaking about Apache Ignite, so it has uh, a lot of usage use cases. Uh, most of them fall into the financial services market because of the guarantees, strong consistency and transactional guarantees that are provided by this platform. But at the same time, uh, there are, uh, in mind, so some of the companies such, such as Silver Spring Networks, Thinworks, that already use Apache Ignite exactly for the IoT scenarios, using Apache Ignite as a distributed storage and computational platform. For instance, if to quickly look at this use case uh, uh, that was uh, shared by Sylvan Spring Network with the Apache Ignite community, uh, what they did, uh, they are using uh, grid gain cluster. Grid gain is uh, an enterprise. So grid gain uh, uses Apache Ignite, builds on top of Apache Ignite, and provides enterprise level features on top of the open source functionality that is available for everyone if you download Apache Ignite. So if you, uh, if to think of grid gain, it's the same Apache Ignite with extra features on top. And still the Spring Networks uses grid gain in production because of the additional enterprise features required. Uh, and what they did, there is a special platform uh, developed in-house, and that platform helps to track information about uh, many uh, electricity pillars deployed nationwide, and depending on the load uh, in different regions or states of the United States, uh, they can move uh, the overall memory, the, the overall electricity usage 
from one region to another. If they face the situation when in one region we see overconsumption of the electricity, but in the other region we see that uh, the electricity is, is not consumed that well, they can move all this stuff over the wires. And uh, they have a kind of an easy problem. Uh, at some point of time, they could not meet uh, their SLAs. Uh, and the architecture was built on, on a classical relational database that was used as the storage and served and processed all the APIs, all the calls. But once uh, they are moved to the uh, grid gain and Apache Ignited, the distributed cluster, they were able to deploy uh, million, dozen of millions meters and all these electricity pillars nationwide and process all the data and all the measurements in real time. This is what they could achieve with uh, this type of uh, architecture. And now uh, the part that I like more. Let me show you quickly a quick demo. So I want to demonstrate how we can, how you can quickly start with Apache Ignite and Spark and I'll ask Laura to facilitate me with this because I need both hands. So first thing, uh, here is I have, I prepared a simple application. I'm going to start a couple of Ignite cluster nodes in my local laptop. It's a really straightforward operation. All I need to do is to call this API method and pass uh, Apache Ignite configuration. This configuration includes just basic parameters such as uh, IP addresses of my cluster nodes so that they can uh, find each other and form a single cluster of machines. Okay, let me start several nodes. Well, we have the first node up and running. We can see that presently there is only one node, cluster node in uh, our, in my local cluster. And here is we are waiting for the second one to join this party. Okay, and now we have two cluster nodes. I have two Apache Ignite nodes on my local laptop running. And the next thing would be the following. Let me just first you how you can monitor the state of your cluster. For that purpose, Apache Ignite community developed a special um, management and monitoring tool. Uh, it's called Apache Ignite Web Console. Uh, this one is named Grid Gain because you can take this Apache Ignite Web Console and deploy on your own hardware, and you can change, you know, the logos, uh, all the parts you need. So this console is deployed on grid gain side. You can also use it for your testing purposes or even in production if you're ready to do this. I'm going to use, this, use it for the sake of the demo. So here is, let me double check that my, I can connect to my local cluster from this console. Yes, so I see my two cluster nodes that are running on my laptop. Uh, there are, I'm not going to use the persistence of the data will be in memory. I don't care. And also, once I started my cluster nodes, I created two uh, caches. So in terms of Ignite, we use the term cache. It's not just a cache of data in memory. It's just it's the same as a table in the relational databases world. But in the distributed world, in the world of Apache Ignite, a cache is your unique table, distributed table, where you store your data. And we are going to have two caches. First one will store information about different sensors deployed somewhere and the temperature reported by these sensors. Okay, now it's time, you know, to start uh, doing something useful with that. Uh, and let me show you how you can work, work with your cluster from Spark at the Spark uh, application developer. So here is my simple Spark application. What I'm doing, I'm starting, I'm preparing Spark configuration, I'm uh, creating uh, streaming context, I'm going to use a Spark streaming framework. And uh, after that, I need to do some basic configuration parameters needed for Spark to talk to Ignite. And here, as you can see, uh, two, uh, those two caches that are already configured in our cluster. And I'm going to connect to those caches by means of Spark shared, by Spark 
RDD APIs. This is what I'm doing in these two lines. And finally, the next, we are going to do two things. The first thing is we are going to preload our sensors cache with some dummy data. Uh, for instance, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create several sensors and you know, install or deploy them in various geographical locations, randomly picking uh, latitude and uh, longitude. Once I've pre -filled, filled in this information, I'm going to save this data into the Apache Ignite by calling this save pairs method. That's the standard method available for you uh, on RDD APIs. Once this is done, uh, I'm going to receive uh, some sample temperature measurements from uh, this local host port number. I'm going to process these measurements. Uh, that will be measurements of the temperature uh, reported by one of the sensors created before. And once I do all these transformations, such as I, I want to add a timestamp to every measurement, I will, I'm going to save all this data, transmit all this data constant, constantly to my Apache Ignite cluster in real time. So Spark is going to receive the data, process it, transform, and send it right away to Apache Ignite cluster. And, once, and while this data is going to be uh, processed and sent to Apache Ignite in real time, I want to execute some, you know, I just want to see what's going on. I want to execute, for instance, select queries over the data that is being streamed into my Apache Ignite cluster. And that query, uh, we are still using a Spark. We are going to, we want, for instance, here is I want to see what was the maximum temperature, how, how many sensors uh, we have in my cluster that reported temperature in this range from 70 to 100. Uh, degrees. That's a simple query. Okay, let's start this simple application. So now Spark is uh, doing his basic setup routines, and right after that, the Spark is going to connect to Apache Ignite using spe special client connection. This is why you see Ignite logo here. So Spark is connecting to Ignite using Ign special Ignite SPI, but you just need to uh, do just valid configuration. You don't need to do anything else just to provide configuration where your Apache Ignite cluster is. That's all what you need to do. Okay, so we are connected, and here is we see some strange errors. Uh, this search errors report says us, errors say us that we cannot, we do not receive anything from this uh, local host port number, no any temperature measurements are transferred to us. Uh, but to do this, there is another simple uh, Java dummy application. So instead of you know, bringing any edge devices here, I wanted to simplify the task for us. So I just created a simple Java application that opens up the server circuit connection. And once our Spark connects to this application, that which in real world will be a mesh of your sensors deployed somewhere, we are going to uh, create different temperature measurements, random measurements uh, for uh, random sensors deployed in our cluster and write them into this circuit connection. And then the Spark will do, this, will, will, uh, will do the rest of the work. Okay, let's start this application. Okay, we see that the Spark was connected to the cluster. And now if we scroll down, we should see that that exception disappeared. And this is the result set reported by our select query. So the data is being received and processed in real time, processed by Spark, sent to my local Apache Ignite cluster. And this query is executed over the data that is on Apache Ignite. This is uh, how many sensors, the IDs of the sensors that reported the temperature in the range of 70 and 100 Fahrenheit. At the same time, uh, uh, we can do some more advanced lookups. Here is we can see that our cluster data is being, uh, is being grown. So we keep putting more temperature data into my cache. Uh, what I can do right now, I just can do some more advanced uh, queries over the data I have in my cluster. So for instance, let me see what was the maximum temperature reported so far by my sample application. 
and it turns out to be that uh, the maximum temperature was one, 109 Fahrenheit. Or in Apache Ignite, you can execute not just simple, you know, uh, SQL queries. You can also execute distributed joins, joining the data that is uh, also stored in different cluster machines. And using this type of join, I want to find out the maximum temperature uh, reported by the sensors uh, located in the boundaries of the United States. So these are the boundaries of the continenta continental part of the United States. And we are going to take a look at what's going on with the temperature in this uh, part of the world. OK, we also can keep executing this query uh, for every two seconds. And for now, we can see that the maximum temperature reported so far uh, was uh, uh, 97. OK, actually, that's all for the demo. And before we, before we move on to the Q&A se session, uh, let me advertise you the uh, In-Memory Computing Summit. It's a conference uh, that, is, uh, that will be uh, that, that will take place in San Francisco uh, in the end of October. And here is if you, if you actually want to learn more about different in-memory technologies, about distributed systems, uh, not only about Apache Ignite for sure. There will be many, plenty of folks who are developing Apache Ignite. But also you can learn a lot about uh, different solutions of vendors such as Hazelcast, Tredis, MemoSQL, VolDB. So if you want to discover more about all these distributed systems and memory technologies, I highly encourage you to stop by this conference. And actually, you can check up whether you are lucky or not. A grid gain is uh, roughly two tickets per week for this conference. So I'm going to share this presentation. And then after the talk, you can go to this link and s try to sign up for this raffle. And finally, thanks to the Lorov who uh, helped me out today. So if you want, today we covered you know, all the features of Apache Ignite that are available in open source version. But if you want to learn more how to gain, uh, how to set up data center replication, or how to set up advanced security, how to do data backups uh, using Apache Ignite cluster, then you can discuss all these uh, questions and topics with her. So having said that, uh, thanks, guys, for attending. And now I'm open to your questions. Hey. Thank you. Um, in the demo, um, you created the RDD from the Ignite, and then you call one of them to save. And when you call the save, what happens? So the RDB that are still resides in the Ignite or they are transferred to the smart mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So once you call this method uh, RDD save, uh, we are going to we are going to use special type of Ignite own streaming technology that will take all the uh, tuples stored in this RDD and will push them into the cluster. Once the data is stored in the Ignite cluster, it will be garbage collected by Java virtual machine where your Spark application is running. And also, when you want to get this data back, or for instance, when I, when I, I showed you how you can execute SQL queries from Spark, uh, that SQL query was executed over the data that is in Ignite. So Spark uh, did not uh, go to Ignite. It did not take the data from Ignite. It did not preload the data back to Spark. So all the queries operate over the data that is already in Ignite. So you don't need to move the data back and forth from Ignite to Spark. So, yeah, so Ignite here is, is Spark treats Ignite here as a distributed storage, such as Hadoop or something like that. The only difference here is that, for instance, Hadoop is a disk-based storage, while Ignite uh, is used as uh, memory-centric storage that can keep data both in memory, in RAM, and on disk. No, 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 no. We, we do not duplicate the data. So once the data is pushed to Ignite, 
it will not be stored in Spark. Yeah, yeah, correct. The data is always in Ignite in this configuration. Any other questions? Okay. If you have, so I'll be here around. So if you want to discuss something, you can talk to me. I can give you more details on uh, all the components we briefly discovered so far, or you can share more details on use cases related to the IoT or different other markets. Or you also can talk to my colleague to learn more about grid gain use cases. Thank you, guys.